All right. Uh, all right. Well, thank you for that wonderful <laughs> introduction, Joe, to tell everybody I was a wiggle. Um, I am uh, Tom Grant. I'm uh, at the University of Buffalo. And um, so I am going to talk to you about um, some phase retrieval that uh, we apply for solution scattering profiles. You've heard a lot about phase retrieval um, for uh, a variety of different uh, 2D and 3D uh, objects. Uh, we are here applying this for 3D objects. Um, however, we are taking one dimensional solution scattering data to reconstruct a three dimensional uh, object. So my expertise is mostly with biological uh, solution scattering or small angle X-ray scattering. Um, however, this can be also applied for any kind of isotropic uh, solution scattering for materials or you know, um, uh, nanoparticles or block polymers, things like that. All right, so for those of you that are not uh, familiar, this is kind of a, a basic outline of a solution scattering experiment. Uh, on the left, we have our incident x-rays where we can use neutrons um, coming in and we have our sample. And our sample is typically in some kind of um, uh, aqueous solvent for biological macromolecules or it can be another type of solvent for um, materials. Um, and because it's in a solution, what ends up happening is the molecules are tumbling in random orientations. And so when they scatter, their three-dimensional intensity functions will all add up and you'll end up with an isotropic scattering profile or scattering pattern on your two-dimensional area detector. And so what you can do is you can perform an azimuthal average in order to get a one-dimensional function of intensity as a function of Q. And from this one-dimensional function, you've lost an enormous amount of three-dimensional information. So this is a low resolution, it's a low information technique However, we can get some useful information from it. Um, so from just this one dimensional profile, we can get um, things like the radius of gyration or the maximum particle dimension. And we can get some size and shape information also from what we call the pair distribution function, which is itself just a 1D Fourier transform of the intensity profile. So this experiment typically gives you some size and shape information at low resolution about your particles. So it's largely a complementary technique um, to add some additional information to other structural methods. When it comes to extracting three-dimensional structural information from these uh, 1D solution scattering profiles, a variety of different algorithms have been developed over the last several decades. Um, one of the first was the use of just simple geometrical shapes, things like prisms and cylinders and ellipsoids or core shells. And the idea here is that you fill each one of these different shapes with some kind of homogeneous uniform density, where it's just one single value throughout this envelope defined by this particle shape. And what you do is you vary the different dimensions of the particle, things like the axial ratios or uh, the length of the cylinder, things like that. And you calculate the scattering profile from these shapes and you compare it with your data and you see which sizes and shapes best match your experimental data. Now we had the um, advent of using collections of simple shapes to get a little bit more complex. Um, and then we have spherical harmonics. And so again, this is the same basic idea where we have a shape that is filled with a uniform homogeneous density. In this case, however, we can define more complex shapes by the use of spherical harmonics. Um, and again, we're calculating scattering profiles from these envelopes in order to figure out and define and optimize what those harmo uh, spherical harmonics coefficients are. And then probably what's most familiar to those of you who are familiar with uh, biological small angle X-ray scattering is the use of bead models. So bead models have kind of become the de facto ab initio modeling um, algorithm for generating three-dimensional shapes from these one-dimensional spherically average solution scattering profiles. And here what we're doing is we're taking a collection of small identical volumes, things like coarse grained beads, um, for example, and you put them on some kind of grid or a lattice, and you effectively just turn them on and off. And you iterate many different conformations of these and arrangements of these different beads. You calculate the scattering profile from them, and you see which one best matches your data, and you optimize it, you minimize it. Now, there's far too many different um, conformations that we could actually, that we can actually calculate. Um, so usually you use some kind of Monte Carlo or genetic algorithm or a simulated annealing procedure in order to attempt to find some kind of uh, local minimum that hopefully is similar to the global minimum. 
And then over the last couple of decades, we've had a lot of advances in the area of what we call hybrid modeling, where we're generating um, more high resolution or at least more complex models that take into account pieces of information from different techniques, things like uh, crystallography, maybe you get fragments of domains, something like that, or cryo EM or NMR, and you merge it all together with your solution scattering data to come up with a more complex model. So I would put all of these methods under the heading of modeling, all these different algorithms I would call modeling. And what I mean by that is that in each case, you're generating thousands or even millions of different candidate confirmations or candidate models that you're then calculating the scattering profile from and minimizing the parameters of that model in order to match your data. So it's always this, this um, forward calculation where you start with the model and you calculate the um, uh, scattering profile to determine which model best matches your data. So I'm going to describe to you a phase retrieval procedure that I developed that allows you to go the inverse problem. We're actually going to take that 1D spherically average scattering profile and have it tell you what the three-dimensional electron density function actually is. So you've heard a lot about this. In order to understand how we do this, we have to kind of understand the um, the Fourier transform relationship between the real space and the reciprocal space domains here. So you've heard a lot about um, our phase retrieval procedures throughout this workshop. So over on the left here, we have our electron density function for a single molecule. If we calculate the Fourier transform of that, we get what we call the molecular transform. It's a 3D complex value function in reciprocal space that is continuous, okay? This is for a single molecule. If we could know the amplitudes and phases of all of these different locations, these are structure factors in reciprocal space. If we knew all the amplitudes and phases of those structure factors at each point, we could calculate an inverse Fourier transform and get back to our electron density map. But as we know, we don't get complex valued structure factors. We of course get just the intensities. So if we were to be able to um, uh, collect data on a protein of this size, for example, for a single molecule X-ray diffraction experiment, we would get intensities. We'd get a whole bunch of 2D cross sections uh, as slices through this molecular transform. But these would be intensities, okay? And because they're intensities, that means we lose a lot of the information. We lose that phase information. So we would know the 3D amplitudes from the 3D intensity function but we would lose the phases. So we have to solve the phase problem, okay? And that's what this whole workshop has been about. So just a quick review of how this works is that in order to do this in single molecule diffraction experiments, the way this is done is using iterative phase retrieval, where we divide this problem into two domains. In one domain, we have the real space domain, which corresponds to our electron density. And in the reciprocal space domain, we have our structure factors. And what happens is that our data are 3D intensities, and then therefore we know our three-dimensional amplitudes. And we can apply our three-dimensional amplitudes in our reciprocal space domain and effectively start with some random phases. And from that, we can calculate an inverse Fourier transform, and that brings us to an initial electron density function that's very noisy, and it's got a lot of connectivity issues, and, and, and it's, it's not close to our actual solution. However, because we have this continuous um, intensity function in reciprocal space, we can take advantage of oversampling and apply some real space constraints, things like solvent flattening. We know our object is a finite object, so we can create a boundary or an envelope around our particle and apply things like solvent flattening, or you can apply positivity or connectivity or any of the number of um, real space projection algorithms, uh, uh, projection operators that you've heard about. Um, and that applies these real space restraints in uh, on our density, we get a new sort of cleaned up electron density map, calculate a forward Fourier transform, and that gives us a new set of structure factors. However, now we've changed those structure factors. We've changed those amplitudes so they no longer match our data. So we rescale our amplitudes so that they match our uh, experimentally observed amplitudes. And we can iterate through this process uh, until, until convergence and, and ultimately retrieve our phases. Okay, so that's for a single molecule imaging experiment where you actually know the three-dimensional amplitudes from your intensities. The problem that we have with solution scattering, however, is that we do not know the three-dimensional amplitudes. We don't get a three-dimensional intensity function. Because our molecules are all tumbling randomly in solution, this nice feature-rich, information-rich um, uh, three-dimensional intensity volume now becomes this 
um, blurred out spherical average where we've lost all of that three-dimensional intensity information. And so we don't know what the 3D amplitudes are. All we know is the 1D spherically averaged intensities. So rather than having to solve just the phase problem in solution scattering, we have to solve what I call the structure factor problem, where we have to determine both the amplitudes and the phases in three dimensions using just that 1D spherically averaged set of intensities. So how do we do this? So I developed this algorithm that I call iterative structure factor retrieval. It's very similar to iterative phase retrieval. We start with a random electron density map. So in this case, um, we uh, sort of discretize our electron density map so that we can do it on a computer um, and to a grid. And this is how we represent our electron density map with a bunch of different random initial values on each one of these grid points. Okay, I'm just showing you a, a, a cross section, a 2D cross section through uh, this electron density map. We calculate a forward fast Fourier transform and that gives us our structure factors in three dimensions from which we can calculate these three dimensional intensities. Now we need to be able to relate these 3D intensities to our one dimensional Sachs profile, okay? So how do we do that? Well, the way that we do that is we bin all of the grid points into a series of concentric Q shells, concentric resolution shells. And we simply just take the average of all of the intensities of all the grid points that fall within each shell. And you do that for each different shell and that gives you a one-dimensional calculated scattering profile corresponding to that initial random electron density. Now, of course, these aren't going to match your actual data, right? Because we started with random density. So somehow we need to change the structure factors such that our spherically average intensities match our experimental data. The way that we do that is by scaling all of the 3D structure factors within a bin by the same number, by the same scale factor. And that scale factor is simply the ratio of the intensities. It's actually the square root of the ratio of the intensities because we're gonna scale the amplitudes of the structure factors. So we apply that scale factor to each one of the grid points that falls within each one of these Q shells. And then you do that for each Q shell. And now what we have is we have a set of structure factors whose uh, intensities have a spherical average that match your experimental data. So now we have um, a set of structure factors that agrees with our experimental data. So we can take this new set of structure factors, calculate an inverse FFT, and that gives us a real space electron density map. Now, the problem with this is that of course, while we match our experimental 1D profile, there are many different ways of, of sort of distributing those amplitudes over three-dimensional sphere, right? Three-dimensional shell, in addition to our uh, three-dimensional phases, right? So we don't actually know how to correctly redistribute those amplitudes. However, it turns out that we can apply real space restraints just like we do in single molecule X-ray diffraction. We can uh, uh, apply these projection operators in real space in order to kind of clean up our density, right? So in order to do that, we have to um, determine a grid boundary here. Um, that we show in this dashed line. And this is the envelope of our particle. Uh, and Jeff had kind of explained how we do this with a shrink wrap algorithm. We do effectively the same thing um, where we just blur the electron density map. We can involve it with a Gaussian filter and we select some kind of threshold. We typically take that to be 20% of the maximum of the blurred um, uh, density map. And effectively what this does is it says where most of your density is. Now we're not actually blurring the real map, we're just blurring the map so that we can determine what the grid points of the support are and what the envelope of the particle is. And then we use that support to apply our solvent flattening. We flatten the solvent and we can apply things like positivity or connectivity um, in order to come up with an electron density map that looks more like what we expect from a particle. Now, of course, in this case, what we've done is we've changed our 1D corresponding scattering profile. So we have to go through this process iteratively until we achieve convergence. And we ultimately end up with a set of structure factors whose spherically averaged intensities match our data and whose corresponding real space electron density matches what we expect, like, like a flat solvent from uh, real space particles. All right, so here I have a quick little animation showing this process taking place. On the top, we have our random electron density that we start with. On the bottom left, we have our raw experimental data 
in the black dots. Remember, this is a 1D scattering profile. Um, rather than using the raw experimental data, we actually fit this with um, a, a function in order to come up with a smooth curve. And that allows us to take advantage of the oversampling inherent in the experiment. And then in the red dots, we have the corresponding intensity profile from the random electron density to start with. And then on the bottom right, we simply have um, a chi-squared metric um, looking at how well um, the goodness of fit is um, of the red dots relative to the black curve. Okay, so you can see that pretty much immediately um, the uh, objects kind of the object kind of collapses to a particle, and then over time it updates, and that update is shrink wrap, right? So you can kind of see it chipping away at the envelope here, and ultimately you can see more high density in the interior as it progressively chips away more and more, applying more and more solvent flattening, and eventually it comes up with a curve that fits the experimental data and ultimately converges. Okay. In this case, we know our electron, we know our structure from a crystal, uh, a separate crystallography experiment. And so we can dock that in to see how well it does. Now keep in mind, this is a low resolution experiment, right? People are typically only using this to get size and shape information. So it actually at low resolution does a pretty decent job of reconstructing the particle shape. But of course, at higher resolution, you see a lot of these fluctuations in the density in the interior. And it turns out that if you were to run this multiple times with multiple different random electron densities to start with, these fluctuations would vary. So you can actually use that information um, to sort of take a look at how the structure reconstruction, the electron density reconstruction will vary and will fluctuate um, from, from uh, run to run. So you run this say 20 times, for example, and what you notice is that in each case, you end up with a slightly different reconstruction. So those at, at low resolution, the objects are actually relatively similar, but at higher resolution, you can see that a lot of these density fe features are not consistent. And that's simply a consequence of not having a lot of information in scattering profile. We typically only got you know, 10, 20, 30 unique pieces of information in a small angle scattering profile. So what we can do is we can align all of these to one another and we can average them. And this gives us a low resolution electron density map whose features are consistent with the actual object, again, at low resolution. Now, an important step here is that um, we have to check for handedness because uh, the enantiomer is ambiguous in small angle scattering. And so um, you just check when you're aligning these that you actually have uh, the same hand. Now, this doesn't tell you the actual handedness because that's ambiguous, but at least make sure that when you're averaging, they all have the same handedness. We can actually um, uh, get a proxy for resolution from this as well. We compare each one of these different individual reconstructions to the uh, average reconstruction. We get a series of different Fourier shell correlation curves, and we can approximate what the actual resolution is. It turns out this actually does a pretty good job. It's almost a one-to-one -one correlation of um, uh, the estimated resolution when we don't know the structure to the true resolution when we do know the structure. So this is all wrapped up in an algorithm that uh, I call DENSE. It stands for Density from Solution Scattering. It's available open source, written in Python at this GitHub uh, page. If you're interested in downloading it and trying it uh, for yourself, it's uh, designed to be very user-friendly and very easy uh, to install and easy to use. There's a lot of handy scripts um, and tutorials available at our, at our website. If you're more into GUIs, um, uh, there is some software for, that's uh, commonly used for biological small angle scattering called BioXS Raw. And that's actually directly integrated within BioXS Raw, so you don't need to download Dense separately. We also have a web server um, uh, available here. Um, and we have uh, GPU acceleration uh, as well. This be this up. Here's just a, a screenshot of our website and our web server. Um, you, this does the whole averaging pipeline. And in most cases, it will actually give you publication quality uh, results with experimental solution scattering data. Uh, we also have a 3D viewer built right into our uh, uh, web server, so you can actually view that density um, and the different contours right in your browser. All right, um, so I'm just going to finish up with uh, a series of examples here um, uh, using uh, experimental data. So this was um, some examples that we had um, done uh, several years ago with some high throughput uh, SACS data that we collected. These are bead models that we reconstructed at the time, and we can compare that with the density reconstruction. And I was actually very surprised that, that uh, DENSE was able to do as well because 
the density reconstruction is actually lacking one major restraint. And that restraint that bead modeling has is the assumption of uniform density. Now, proteins actually can be assumed to have uniform density. They're pretty much made up of carbons and nitrogens and, and oxygens. And at low resolution, they have effectively a uniform density, which is why bead modeling has worked so well over the last two decades. Um, however, in the case of density, we're actually reconstructing this entire, entirely new variable of the uh, density values. So the fact that it's coming up with shapes that are as good as bead modeling, I, I think is very exciting. Um, in addition to uh, being able to reconstruct the overall shapes, um, we actually have a few cases here where there is some additional density for regions that are not covered by the corresponding crystal structures. And it actually turns out, if you look at those, we're missing in the crystal structures, we're missing about 20% of the residues. And it turns out that we can see them in the Sachs reconstruction because it's at low resolution. They're a little bit disordered in the crystal structure, so they didn't show up. But in Sachs, we can actually visualize uh, some of that disordered, uh, those disordered regions. Now, it does, of course, have its limits. In particular, it, it, it doesn't like um, high aspect ratio shapes, so things that are very elongated rods or very flat disks um, with a lot of features. Um, typically, it does a good job up to a, a, an aspect ratio of about five to one, um, uh, but once it gets up to around 10 to one, it, it, it doesn't do particularly well, but actually neither does, neither does bead modeling, to be honest. So that's just um, a difficulty in the ambiguity of, of uh, the SACS reconstructions um, and the SACS data. Uh, so here's an example where we actually have both uh, dense and bead modeling doing a, doing a pretty good job of reconstructing the overall shape. But there's some additional information provided by dense. You can actually see the pores in this uh, membrane protein. You can see these channels um, uh, because we're actually looking at the, the density reconstruction itself. And here's just another case on the bottom for a difficult, a difficult shape. Now, proteins are great. They're a great way of testing this. But again, they can be approximated relatively well by um, a uniform electron density. But there are cases that cannot be approximated well by uniform electron density. Here's one such case where we have a protein dimer that is connecting to two um, uh, uh, micelles. And so these micelles actually have these electron-rich head groups at the outer shell, and the core of them are these low-density um, lipid tails. And when we look at the reconstruction from this experimental data, we can actually see that not only does dense do a good job of reconstructing the overall dumbbell shape, which is a difficult shape for these 1D algorithms to reconstruct, but it's actually also able, when you look at a cross section, it's able to actually see these interior density fluctuations. It can see at low resolution that we have that low density inner core and these high density um, outer shell regions. Here's another example for a protein that was considered a very, very, it's actually the most um, uh, ambiguous shape in the PDB, according to what we call an ambiguity score, anything over uh, 1.5 is considered highly ambiguous, and this is uh, the highest score in the PDB. So it's very difficult to reconstruct this shape uh, by ab initio modeling algorithms. And it turns out not only does DENSE do a pretty good job of actually reconstructing the envelope, but if you look closely, you'll actually see that there's these sort of red hot spots, these three different hot spot regions in the uh, inside of the envelope. And that actually corresponds when you overlap the known structure, that corresponds to these three different domains of the protein that are connected by these linkers. And we can actually utilize this information when we don't know what the overall structure is. And that allows us to do some additional things like rigid body modeling. So there, here's a few examples um, where people have actually done that um, in, the, in the literature. So DENSE returns a standard MRC formatted map, which is what we use for cryo-EM reconstructions. So many of the tools that were previously built for cryo-EM reconstructions can be directly used with DENSE reconstructions. Here's a case that was published a couple of years ago where they did rigid body modeling. So they used our web server to reconstruct um, an ab initio density map. And they had these three fragments that they had from crystallography. They used um, some software called phoenix.doc and map to do the real space docking, where it actually docks each one of these different pieces in turn in order to optimize the fit. Um, and then they can, of course, calculate a scattering profile from that atomic model. And they were able to get a very good chi squared value. Um, here's another case where they used uh, Chimera and Phoenix.RealSpaceRefine to minimize um, the uh, real space orientation and uh, uh, orientations of these two pieces of this complex. And again, they were able to calculate a good chi-squared value. We also have symmetry as one of our projection operators. 
Um, we allow um, both cyclical and dihedral symmetry. So you can actually apply an n-fold rotational symmetry or for things like GROEL or, or commonly tetramers, you can apply dihedral symmetry, which in addition to the seven-fold rotational symmetry for GROEL, then you have seven two-fold perpendicular um, rot uh, rotation, rotational symmetry as well. Um, here's a case with a DNA binding protein that was published um, uh, last year that they had a protein that they had solved the crystal structure of that showed that it was um, a, a nonimer, a nine-fold symmetry in their crystal structure, and they confirmed it with dense. And it turns out that um, when they looked at the dense envelope and they applied the symmetry, they found that relative to their crystal structure, the dense envelope had these extra lobes on the outside. So what they did is they applied a rigid body modeling algorithm where they allowed for a hinge region in this outer domain, and they allowed that to fit to the electron density map. And then they were able to get a better chi-squared fit um, when they calculated the scattering from their new rigid body model. And so this actually helped them to uh, discover this open close mechanism for binding to DNA. They were actually able to get this accurate enough to propose some mutational studies to confirm that this is actually how DNA binds and come up with some uh, new information that they didn't previously have. Um, so again, proteins are great because they're, they're, um, they're uniform density at low resolution, but there are cases where this is not true. And actually there are some cases, particularly with using lipids and detergents, where the uh, assumption of a uniform density is actually um, uh, uh, prohibitive to actually reconstructing uh, a quality model. So in the case of dense, you can actually remove the positivity restraint and allow for negative density. And this is the case with things like micelles or lipid containing particles that where the lipid density in the tail region is actually so low, it's actually less than the solvent, so when you do this experiment, you end up with a contrast. So you end up with negative contrast for this um, uh, tail region where those uh, detergent and lipid tails are. And so we call this membrane mode in SACS, uh, in, in dense, and you can just effectively, all it does is just turn off the positivity restraint. Here's a nano disc where we can, um, some experimental data from a nano disc. We've got a top view here. Um, you can see the negative contrast in the interior. It also works directly with um, small angle neutron scattering as well. Here's another case where we've got a, a DDM micelle. Uh, it's got a nice spherical shape as we expect. Dense is able to reconstruct the positive density on the outside and the negative contrast on the inside. But this is uh, a particular case that, that does not do well with reconstructing with bead modeling and even multi-phase bead modeling does not do, um, does not do a good job of reconstructing uh, the object. So Dense is able to uh, add some information here. Um, and finally, as a last example, um, we can use also material science. So this was, this was actually probably the only um, uh, publication I'm aware of yet uh, that has applied dense for um, non-biological applications. Um, and this is actually one of the nice things about this kind of being like a model-free reconstruction algorithm because there's, and what I mean by model-free is that there's no assumption of any form factors or coarse grain beads or atoms or X-ray form factors or neutron form factors. We can work directly with um, many different types of data. Um, and this works with then biological or non-biological molecules. It doesn't assume that's in an aqueous solution. It's just a straight Fourier transform. In this case, um, they have uh, toluene as the solvent and they were proposing that this um, molecule had actually formed an octamer when they did the ab initio reconstruction. It looked very close to what they had proposed and they were able to come up with a model by fitting this that actually showed um, uh, agreement with their, with their data. Um, and lastly, um, dense is actually becoming uh, somewhat popular now. And so um, now this biological data, this small angle scanning biological data bank allows you to deposit the results from um, our uh, dense reconstructions, these MRC files directly into their database. All right, and with that, I am happy to uh, take any questions. I'd like to um, uh, thank a lot of people, especially uh, several interns that have helped over the years in adding lots of nice little features to make dense very um, user-friendly and this uh, long list of people that have helped with, with uh, a lot of discussions and helping me understand many of these pieces. Um, and also a quick blurb, if anybody's interested, I'm, I'm currently accepting applications for um, various uh, positions in my, in my lab uh, funded by NIF, NSF and NIH. So if you're interested, please send me a uh, CV. With that, I can take any questions.